Join me at CMC. Get engaged and get educated. Join me at CMC. Everyone is welcome. Join me at CMC. Come grow your relationships. Join, Join us at CMC. CMC. CMC is real, authentic conversation. conversation. Engage with curious people. Plus, we give you access to thought leaders. Be informed, be inspired. Through community conversation. Come here and meet your neighbors. Be here in the room. Ask questions. Get, get answers. answers. Connecting people and ideas. Learn about Columbus. Who will you see at CMC? Join me at CMC. You're invited. Watch us on live stream or in person. You're invited. Join the conversation. You're, You're invited. Welcome to CMC. Good afternoon. Hello, welcome. So happy to see you all. Thank you for joining us today. We're so happy to see you. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. To carry out its mission, CMC explores public policy issues, current events, and lessons in leadership every Wednesday. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Carrie Schmidt, Managing Partner with Plentiful, and I serve on the Board of CMC Trustees. Let's begin by welcoming our newest members. Please welcome Wesley Newhouse with Newhouse Profiter Coleman and Hogan, Caitlin Grassell of Franklin County Clerk of Courts, Farhan Chote with Dalmar TV, Tony Macaluso with Columbus Realtors, Gabrielle Riceland, and Robin Kinford. Welcome to CMC. If you're not already a CMC member, there was a lot of new people, so you may be not. Uh, today is a great day to join. Please do join us. Join us here every Wednesday. Join us as a community who cares a lot about our conversation about things that are impacting Central Ohio and beyond. Um, and if you do join, next time you'll get one of these sought after, I don't have it on, it's over there, sought after green name tags uh, when you attend the next forum. Also, please take a moment to look on the back of your forum flyers. You'll see organizations that provide the not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club with half of its annual revenue. To join these sponsors, please see Jane Scott or Lainey Cuthbert. Thank you to today's forum partner, WBNS. 10 TV. Today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. And let's thank all of those supporting today's forum. Mm -hmm. 
All right, now turning to the topic at hand today. Uh, heritage tourism is again bringing travel dollars to Ohio. The National Trust for Historic Preservation defines heritage tourism as traveling to experience the places, artifacts, and activities that authentically represent the stories and people of the past and the present. Places like these abound in Ohio, with more than 58 historic sites and museums supported by Ohio History Connection. There's more than just preserving the past at stake. A study of the Travel Industry Association shows that heritage travelers stay longer at their destinations and spend more money than other types of travelers. We're excited to explore the impact and the future of heritage tourism in Ohio with today's speakers. Please welcome Napoleon Bell, co-founder of the Heritage Tours, Megan Wood, the new executive director and CEO of the Ohio History Connection, and our host, Tracy Townsend, news anchor of WBNS-TV's Wake Up See Bus and 10TV News at Noon. You can learn more about today's speakers in the forum, forum flyer. And Tracy, we look forward to today's conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are ex as excited about uh, our speakers as I am. Um, I do want to thank CMC for the invitation and uh, tell you that it's nice to have lunch with people and there aren't TVs around and scanners going off in the newsroom and there are nice napkins, so that was really great. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, I really am excited to be here. Um, I don't know, just by show of hands, how many of you like history? Oh, good, my people, my people. <laughs> I did want to share with you something that's not in the brochure. I am a native Ohioan. I'm from outside of Cincinnati from a place called Mount Healthy. I don't know if there are any, oh, oh, hello, people, my Mount Healthy people. Um, but the history of Mount Healthy is that um, back in 1817, it was founded north of the river. And for Cincinnatians, you all know that's the Ohio River. Um, but there was a cholera epidemic. And so the folks there then migrated north which is Hamilton Avenue, and they settled in Mount Pleasant. But Mount Pleasant got passed over by the cholera epidemic, and so it became Mount Healthy. Isn't that cool? So I knew that because every day when my dad drew, drove me to school, there was the, the historical marker that outlined that, and I really was very interested in that. But I say that to, I share that with you because I love history. And so the thought of heritage, uh, Tourism really appealed to me. I'm the oldest of four kids, and so I just thought Daddy was just taking us on trips because it was cheap. But we learned a lot. So that's the setup for our guests today because we're going to talk about this and talk about their journey and their passion and what inspires them. And so I'm going to start with um, Napoleon Bell, who is with us as a founder of the Heritage Tours. And I'd like to have you start by talking about what inspired the Heritage Tours and your your passion for history. Oh wow! So, I guess I guess it starts um, the heritage. Well, the passion for history. Let me first start with that. Uh, I think it was from my father. Um, he was Napoleon Bell Sr. and uh, he was big into civil rights. Uh, he was also big into making sure that you understood your the past and the history, so that you don't repeat some of those things into the future. And uh, so the things that he was involved in. Um, especially in the civil rights piece that uh, in regards to housing or lack thereof and, and the ability to get a mortgage if you're an African-American and uh, all the things that played into that says, son, you, re you really need to learn about your history. Um, although I wasn't a big history buff um, in, high, in, in, in school, uh, but he really did, when talking to him and talking to my grandparents, um, really brought that to fruition um, about understanding your past and, 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 and where you're going. So that was kind of the, started to build the, the, the energy in myself to start looking at history. And then also I looked toward, you know, my sister also, she's big into genealogy. And so that even brought it to, to more fruition. Um, and, and, and then we started, the, we looked at the, the actually the, the, the tours started with the city um, when I was with the city as a director there with the uh, Community Relations Commission. And, uh, and then in 2016, um, when, I, when I left, 
we continue to get calls about, uh, we really enjoyed this. This is, this is really something you should continue doing. So the, the, my, my wife and I started talking about it and she was getting calls. And so we said, okay, we need to keep this going because we cannot let something like this lay down and just go and fade away because of the impact that it had made on so many lives that we continue to get calls from, especially so many of the young people. And I'll tell you more about that in just a few, but um, it, it made that uh, positive impact on their lives and they still talk about it today. And so we says, well, we need to continue doing this. And so in 2016, that's when the, the Heritage Tours was created um, and to continue that pathway of, of educating young people and, and more, more mature people alike uh, on on this uh, on this tour, so that's my passion. So once you once you've been on it, you, you you just can't stop because once you see the light bulb come on, it's like this this is what I'm here for. So that's my passion. All right, we're going to also hear from Megan Wood, who I hope you don't mind if I say you're a history maker as well. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, came to love history as um, really I, I had the experience that a lot of people in our field have is that they had an excellent teacher and I had some really excellent teachers who wove together um, the humanities. I had the opportunity to learn um, in the 10th grade, my, our English and our history class woven together and there was music and there was art and there was life because, and so for me that really became history is this interdisciplinary crossover of all of life not just, you know, names and, and dates. Um, and so that really got me excited about history. And, and in college, I discovered a program um, called Public History. And so it was, I wanted, I wanted to share a love of history. I saw how I understood myself better and then had more empathy for other people and, and seeing that each person has a path, um, both as themselves, but also, you know, where they came from. And and I wasn't sure that I wanted to teach in the classroom, and I found public history, which focuses on local history, on archives, on historic preservation and museums, and then decided to um, go into museum studies. Uh, I went and got a master's in museum history museum studies. My parents are happy that I'm employed after I, <laughs> you know, broke that news to them that I was going to go get a graduate degree. Um, uh, but just I'm just feel so fortunate that I've been able to um, take this passion and make it a career and just look at how um, our places impact um, those who come and visit them and also the communities in which they sit. So let's talk about, we've heard the definition of heritage tourism, traveling to experience the places, the artifacts and activities that authentically represent the stories and people of the past and present. Can we um, talk a little bit about some destinations or um, places here in our state that represent Ohio that's that people should go see experience yeah I mean there's so many places I, I can talk a little bit to start with central Ohio um, and then I also think about the way that places other places um, tie to Ohio mm -hmm. like the the heritage tours but um, you know in, in central Ohio we have of course, um, great museums and cultural institutions. I, of course, have to mention, shout out our Ohio History Center and Ohio Village. Um, but also something we're really excited about is um, in, with the Native American history is our upcoming um, designation in the World Heritage List. So this might not be something everyone's familiar with, but there is a serial nomination, which means multiple sites that um, UNESCO World Heritage, which is the you know the worldwide designation um, of significance um, for uh, the Newark Earthworks, um, Fort Ancient, um, and Hopo Culture uh, um, Park in uh, Chillicothe. So uh, those that nomination will be voted on next summer, and um, those sites are uh, hope. We say hope well, but you know, 2,000 years ago, um, architecture built by American Indians who were here in this place we now call Ohio, and that um, th there are those sites. But we just live amongst um, the remnants of this culture, and we don't think about it the same way. I was in Rome this summer, and I was like, we we have this, you know, but it's it's these American Indian um, sites, and so this designation is going to give us the opportunity to welcome the world to Ohio. Um, and, and that, you know, it'll go beyond folks visiting those destinations. They'll probably fly into Columbus Airport um, and be staying the night. And, 
and be looking at um, more beyond that history. So we can be really proud of that um, and steward that and, um, and also be welcoming others into our backyard. Do you build on that? Well, you know, I'd like to add, um, you know, part of our tour, um, it, well, it starts in Columbus, right? At the Ohio History Connection. So it starts in Columbus. And then uh, we leave there um, and we used to go down to the Freedom Center. So we first started out going to the Freedom Center was our first stop. And so what an amazing place. Has, has anybody here ever been to the Freedom Center? Okay, all right. Well, whoever didn't raise your hand, you gotta get there, right? Um, so the Freedom Center, and, and uh, but then we, we uh, cause we, we did that for several years and said, well, let's change up our first stop. And so we went over to Ripley, Ohio to the John Parker House and the John Rankin House. Um, and what an amazing piece there is that you're able to truly um, see where those who were running from the south to the north coming across the Ohio River, coming up the long steps and all of that, um, to really be a part of that, right? Um, and they have a great docents that are there to, to really bring you into uh, really feeling as though that, that you're going back in time because of the places that you see there. Um, so if I could go on, if I could wrap in the, the sure. whole tour. Okay, so um, so our, our tour starts in Columbus. We go down to, to Ripley, Ohio, to the John Parker and Rankin House. From there, we go to Atlanta, to the King Center there, to the Martin Luther King Center, and to where um, Martin Luther King was born in the house up, up the road, um, and also visit the National Park, which is all right there in that complex where um, they are entombed. Um, from there, we go to Tuskegee, to where the Tuskegee Airmen practiced out of, and where, uh, so we go to Moton Field and check that out, and they have a museum there. And from there, we go to the, to the college, Tuskegee University, um, to visit some, uh, uh, the, the George Washington Carver Museum and also the Booker T. Washington's home. Um, and then I have to, some of this, I, I keep forgetting, um, we have to, we go from there to um, Selma, uh, where the Edmund Pettus Bridge is and the, and the uh, Civil, Rights, uh, Civil Rights, Civil War Museum, um, the Browns Chapel, uh, where all that is. And we actually physically walk across that bridge. Um, and during our tour, we also play videos to kind of get you prepared for where you are going to, um, which makes a total difference. We put you in the mindset of that. Um, from there, we go to uh, Birmingham, Alabama, where the 16th Street Baptist Church is in, Tus in the uh, Kelly Ingram Park, and also the Civil Rights Museum there. From Birmingham, we go to Montgomery, to the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, where they have the memorial and the museum there. Has anybody ever been to that? EJI. Okay, tell everybody about that. That's, I mean, that was a very powerful place to go. If you can go, just go to one place, do that. Um, also, the Rosa Parks Museum and the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, Museum. Uh, then from uh, Birmingham, then to Montgomery, then all, then to Memphis, Tennessee, to the Lorraine Motel. And we visit that, and that's a, a half day piece there. And then from, we're not done yet. So we says, okay, well, let's come back up north. So we come back up north to Louisville and to, to the Muhammad Ali Museum. And so that is a, it's, it's an all-encompassing tour, um, uh, retracing the steps of the civil rights heroes and sheroes of, of the day. And so by taking 50 people or so, uh, one bus, but we also make sure that we try to provide scholarships for at least 12 to 15 young people who would not have the, the wherewithal to be able to go and also give them a, 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 a stipend for, for each day. So, um, but that, we do that through donations and begging for money to be able to do that. But um, so by doing that, is, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, you know, when we talk about, think about tourism in Ohio, you know, it's, we have such amazing places here just within Ohio. And it makes all the difference when you go to the location where things happen at, because you can really feel what happened then. You can really have a better idea. It's not like reading a book or seeing it on TV. When you can go to a place, and we have all, a lot of those places here in central in, in, in Ohio that can really give you that feeling and you learn so much more by being there. Like Selma, if you've ever gone to Selma, it's like going back in time, it truly is. Yeah, I challenge anyone to go to Rankin House and yeah. look over that river and not mm. feel something, you mm. know, that that's, that's like the deep, yeah. the deep connection. Oh, just to place. realize how, how people had to, you know, might not have shoes on, right? Mm -hmm. And going through everything that you had to go through just to get to the Ohio River. Yeah. Can we talk about the history connection in the context of, if you're staying in the state, it's not just the building there off 71. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> Though it's a very exceptional example of it's brutalist right. architecture. Yes. <laughs> um, please come visit. Uh, 
Um, yeah, we have a network of 58 sites that are a part of our, um, our system um, all over the state, and we operate many of those with um, management partners. And actually, we're really kind of verging on um, 59, because Poindexter Village, which is, and I see my, my friends here um, from JPPF, the James Preston Poindexter Foundation, um, will be opening, hopefully, in the not-too-distant future. Um, but we have everything from natural history to um, the Neil Armstrong Air and Space Museum, Fort Meigs. So we have a, a broad variety of, of sites. And, and we see each of those locations as an opportunity to anchor um, visitation and impact. But it's also connected to the broader community and other cultural institutions. Like how is, how is each of these places a part of a, a, a network? Um, of heritage, tourism, and, and um, culture. And, you know, as we come out of, I hesitate to even phrase it this way, but as we come out of the pandemic, because uh, we're coming out, we're coming out. Um, <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> we all have the opportunity to go places. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk about that economic impact? Because I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, for both of you, there was a little bit of a slow period there, but now? Yeah, and I, I think from what we hear from uh, professionals uh, in the in the tourism business and in, in travel um, and the CVBs is that you know it's really um, uh, coming back this year um, and that uh, there you know was over 201 million visitors we welcome to Ohio and you know one of the things we talk about and we think about is that when there is this um, web of things to do or when we're talking about world heritage is that when people move from just being a day visitor, which we have a lot of day visitors, to being an overnight visitor, they spend three times as much money. And that's one of the things that, you know, that we think about with our partners is how do we encourage um, a trip that does um, many things um, and we, we imagine that we'll see a lot of Ohioans to begin with, like with World Heritage, and we see that at a lot of our sites, but how do we encourage more of even that in-state travel um, and overnight stays and discovery and appreciation and the love of our own history? You know, one thing also that um, about our tour is that we didn't get people coming from Columbus, right? We got people come, actually sign up from as far away as California to fly in to be a part of the tour. So what an opportunity so we have a captive audience and we can continue to talk about, you know, not just our tour, but Ohio, right? Where you've, where you've come to, uh, to start the tour. So um, we really, we've, we've had several people come from out of state to Ohio and hopefully then we'll capitalize with our connection with the history connection to, to keep them here in Ohio. Can either of you share with us some aha moments from people who have come through one of the sites or on the tour yeah. about Ohio and what's here? Well, I, I can start. So, um, and I don't think it's, it's not necessarily about Ohio, but it's about um, a young person. So we had a young person that was out of um, um, South High School and we had, were able to provide a scholarship for him to go and, and uh, a chaperone able to go. And so throughout the tour, um, we went to a lot of these sites. And so midway through the tour, we have a night that we have a what, talent show night, but we also have a round table. And the round table is to be able to debrief kind of on what, what you've all seen and heard and this, that, and the other. And so we all gathered around. There was probably about 35 people or so in the room or in a round circle. And we were all going around talking about, you know, what the impact was. Well, this young person started talking and he, he had stated, he says, you know, he started talking about his past. He says, you know, he had, he had tough childhoods and, uh, you know, things weren't, weren't the best and this, that, and the other, but he was still in school and trying to do his best there. He said, but, but here's one thing that this tour has done for me. He says, this is the t only time that I've able, been able to speak and be heard. And so that really set us back in our seats to, to, to um, the weight of that, that this is an opportunity that our young people are feeling as though they have a space that they can have a conversation and then be connected with folk that are older, more mature, because we did that purposely also, was that they have someone to connect with um, and, and learn from. Uh, so it's great to have a captive audience for six days, but the thing is you really learn a lot and, and it really brings people, that's what they remember um, from the tour. And we, we have some young people that have been involved in the Martin Luther King oratorical contest and all that type of stuff. So, But that's what I remember is that the impact of, of the locations that make the difference in the, in the lives of young people and older people alike. 
I know we've had a lot of experiences um, working with students and um, some of my colleagues, this has been several years ago, did a project on the Near East Side where they were doing history of some of the historic buildings. And in the evaluations, the students were saying things like, oh, I understand why these old places that I just thought were old and falling apart were important. And I think that that's always, you know, that, that realization that, um, you know, this is a part of our authentic past and that it's worth, um, worth saving. And there's just so many times where you, someone's like, oh, that happened like right here. You know, when somebody, when you can stand in the space and, you know, one I remember for my, myself that isn't um, our organization, but I was at the Air Force Museum and there's the plane um, that where Johnston, Johnson was sworn in, you know, as president and you can stand in that spot um, and you just have like such a, like it happened right here. And I, and I think that that's always the thing I carry with me is like, really being able to show people you can come stand in that, that spot and and feel it, uh, at least for me, I'm always crying and getting goosebumps about history. Um, I realize I'm not quite a normal person, but um, but I think I that's you know, I cry. You know, um, just giving more of those opportunities and even for ourselves that um, sometimes we talk about like archaeological sites that they're all over the place and and I think sometimes people are surprised, like there's an archeological site here that, that this stuff didn't happen some far away, far flung place. Like this is all you know, within our reach. Well, I'd like to add one thing also. One thing that I continue to hear um, is we didn't learn about this in school. Yeah. We didn't learn about yeah, this right. in school. And so that's when you're seeing the light bulbs are just kind of like, oh my gosh, really? That really? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, I, when we talk about civil rights, the only thing that they know going in is Martin Luther King you know, in the speech, I have a dream speech. But when they see the full game and all the people that played a part in this, both white and black and everybody who was a part of, of all of this, that, that, that truly made a difference. They're like, my gosh, I did not know that, mm -hmm. right? Did not learn that in school. That is not the history that I have learned. And so that's another aha moment. Now, now you're getting, so there, there's then the spark to learn more about true history that truly happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the opportunity and where, is your space respectively in building on opportunities for places that could be historical or that are here in our state? You know, one of the things um, that we like to talk about are, and I hope we can, we talk about more is um, in preserving um, historic buildings and um, historic downtowns, um, the small main streets. I love when I drive around um, Ohio to go visit our sites or our partners, and you just see a real authentic place that has been saved and preserved. And um, there's a program um, where there are historic uh, preservation tax credits where it's a tax credit, both federal and from the state, that allows developers to, um, to preserve historic buildings according to the highest standards. I see some folks from Columbus Landmarks here um, uh, as well. And um, that is a um, program that not only maybe creates the opportunity for um, tourism to an area in economic development, it also creates jobs and investment, and then it also pays itself back. So. Um, when we preserve the authentic places, like a place like Hamilton, Ohio, or I think about all the work that's been happening in Newark, it creates better places to want to go visit, um, again, in our backyard. And so that, that investment that goes um, into um, economic development and drawing in businesses, it, it also plays into heritage tourism and the attractiveness of places to visit. Can you talk more about what's happening in Hamilton? Yeah, Hamilton had a whole uh, series of um, historic tax credit projects that revitalized um, parts of the town and brought, you know, more businesses coming in. And it just really, um, I think, hotels, it just really transformed from the where, you know, you're also familiar with driving through a sleepy town where you said this used to be great. Well, now it, it's great again. Um, and so you really see over the course of like 20 years, a big change. Yeah. I tell you, my wife and I have, have, have are talking about now actually how can we, you know, really highlight those historic locations in Ohio um, to do some shorter tours, mm -hmm. right? Because you know every place has its story, and so what, whether big or small, it has a story. Mm -hmm. And so imagine, you know, being able to take a tour. Maybe it's one or two days, 
but to hit these different locations and to be able to hear their story and to then appreciate their story and how that came about. And so often, you know, we, we do look at some old buildings in the setting and we're like, well, it's going down, but it has a story. And if we're going to learn from that, we need to preserve that and preserve that story. And so we're hoping that we can do, we'll continue doing the, the, the longer tour, but what can we do though around Ohio to really highlight um, the, the gems that we have and, and the, those history markers that we have here in central Ohio and hopefully bringing more people to, to really be able to feel that and be a part of that. Before I forget, I wanted to have you, Megan, talk about that world heritage, the status. Are there other places that you can give us an example of? They already have it. We're trying to get it. Yeah. So in the United States, there are 26, 24. You see, I'm looking. I phoned a friend over here. <laughs> um, there's only uh, 24 uh, world heritage sites. Um, most recently, um, there was a collection of Frank Lloyd Wright um, buildings that were put on the list. And before that, the San Antonio Missions. You may have heard of a little place called the Alamo. Um, <laughs> and also like the Grand Canyon. Um, and then around the world, you know, if you, tr if you travel outside the country, the Coliseum, Stonehenge. And what I want to say about Stonehenge is that if you go to Newark Earthworks in the octagon, there's a little circle on the side and Stonehenge can fit in that little tiny circle. So, you know, it's like we have, what we have is even bigger. Um, but uh, so, you know, it's this highest designation of um, universal uh, human uh, value. And it just, or excuse me, the outstanding universal value. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's this, it's this expression of human genius. And um, if you're not familiar with the octagon in Newark, there's an 18.6 year cycle of the moon, which I am not going to explain right now. Um, but there's a, a time in that cycle where the moon um, rises and sets at the northernmost and southernmost um, point. And two points in that octagon are you know aligned with that perfectly? So it just shows the the genius of the culture, you know, whose um, remains that we live among. And then we do we vote on this next year? Or do, do you have so some special designation? There's um, a committee mm -hmm. um, of UNESCO that votes on it, and they'll vote next summer. So we submitted our application, which is really like a very long and technical book um, that we submitted, and it was our application was accepted. Um, and they'll be voting on it um, next June, probably. And you already explained that Stonehenge could fit into the space here, so I'm going to throw some more shade. Who's our competition? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that it's a zero sum, uh, you know, that there's only so many votes. So I don't know if we're, we're not necessarily up against, you know, they can add as many as they want. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we're still the best, but, um, uh, but uh, no other World Heritage Sites in Ohio um, and the closest ones are uh, Cahokia Mounds and uh, some of the Frank Lloyd Wright sites. So um, we'll, you know, we'll have really a draw internationally here. That's great. Um, let's talk about education because you both kind of touched on that. We've talked about the economic impact. Where in the space can we help our kids um, learn more and not say, oh, I didn't learn that. They're, I mean, do we need a longer school year? I know the kids are booing that, but you know what I mean? Well, in regards to civil rights, I think because I've been involved in a lot with um, um, on the um, Governor's Commission for the um, Ohio Martin Luther King celebration. And uh, we have an oratorical contest uh, every year in which young people are involved in that. And they actually give their orations um, about a particular topic that is chosen um, at the beginning of the year. And so from that, they have to do some research and to educate themselves on, on uh, what they're going to talk about. But then they memorize, for the most part, their orations about this particular topic. And so there is a piece where um, we're continuing to push the envelope on not just you know hearing or, or seeing what you read in the books, this, that, and the other, but to really dig deep into, into uh, whether it be the internet, whether it be books, whether it be family, to come up with an oration that is uh, powerful and impactful for the audience. So um, that part of it is, is a big education piece. And then we're also trying to build a resource uh, area of our website to be able to provide more education, more educational tidbits for, for young people. But um, the bus, you know, we call it, it's the Freedom Riders on, on the bus. Uh, but we call it, we, it's, it's an educational bus. It's an educational piece on, on wheels. 
for six days. And it's for kids of all ages, I'm saying. Kids I'm of saying. all ages. So we've had from about, I think, nine years old, mm -hmm. 10, about 13, okay, 10, 13, <laughs> they're all kind of in that, in that range, from 13 years on up. So we've, we've actually had a range from 13 to about 85 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, uh, there was a, a, a more mature person that had a scooter and we worked that out. So we want, we want everybody to have an opportunity, uh, no matter what your ability to be able to go through. But 13 is about the age because, it, because of some of the sites that you see and go into and some of the conversations. So 13 is uh, about a good, 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 good age to start. We have worked with schools a lot. And, you know, I think the, the tricky part of working with um, schools is that every district is different. Every teacher is different. Every school is different. And there's a lot of challenges that that teachers are dealing with right now so mm -hmm. the you know the traditional field trip we're not seeing as many of those i don't think they'll ever go away but one of the realities for us as um a public institution that's inviting people in is like how do we fill the gap with families or after school programs how are we there maybe outside of in addition to the school day as um, being able to still go and visit you know we do a lot of virtual stuff but there's no replacement to the real thing um, and so I just encourage anybody who's on the funding side of things on PTOs you know what you work with is just thinking about how you give students the opportunities um, I mean I fell in love with museums on a school field trip um, and it might not be that you know I want to make everybody a museum professional, but you know, you might fall in love with engineering on a field trip, or you might fall in love with something else. And um, I think it's it's there's so much pressure in the school environment. It's like, how as a community do we give those opportunities? And that investing in arts and culture, um, you know, sometimes when you're looking at the whole array of things, it may seem like a, a nice to have, but um, there's a lot about it that can be really essential or help with things that are essential in our world. And we talk about we talk about the the economic impact. There has to be a little piece of that there, right? Yeah, that there's um, how many there's so many jobs in Ohio that are tied to heritage tourism, um, and and that that's you know that's a piece of it too. That it isn't in addition to it's many people's well being, and that the other businesses that you know see the impact of that as well. Um, so you know, for us just to talk more openly about. Um, in addition to the the great and fun experiences that we have, that we are part of the whole environment. Do you feel like um, it's been your experience that we are talking about it more uh, more openly these days? I don't know if that's a function of being shut down for a while. Yeah, it might it might be because there was a lot of conversation about what's the impact of um, of the shutdown during COVID and how how hard it was for many for lots of nonprofits to survive. How much we were on the edge. Um, of survival and, and what do we learn from that. Um, but I also think there's just something, you know, especially Midwestern where we're like, well, I don't want to brag too much, you know, that it's <laughs> that it's that, you know, like that we just need to to be better um, about bragging about what we do, about our history, and that, you know, when people are coming to work at Intel or they're coming to go to your on your tour, that we're, you know, we're bragging on ourselves. Does it prevent, uh, present an opportunity for some partnerships? that perhaps weren't there before? Yeah, there's. Yeah. I think there's so many partnerships. Oh, yeah. and well, I, I think so, definitely on the tour. Like I, when, we, when I talked about, you know, changing the tour, making it more uh, Ohio-oriented, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more uh, uh, partners that, that can happen. Also, you know, when we talk about locations, so it's not just those museums, but, you know, what about, uh, you know, in, in an area of aviation and sports, mm -hmm. right, and doing some of the tours that, that are, that are uh, along those lines. Uh, I'm getting my private pilot's license. One day I'll finally finish this thing, but I love aviation, right? Uh, then I can fly your tour. Then I can fly the tour. <laughs> All aboard my little Cessna. That's great. So um, do you have, do you have favorite location? Can I ask you if you have favorite locations? I'm going to ask you because I have to have the mic. Do you have a favorite location or two in our state? Or it, that's one of your sites? Yeah, I mean, they're all my favorites. They're all your favorites. <laughs> they're all your favorites. Good answer, good answer. <laughs> and I, I love them all equally. Um, I'll, but I will say, uh, so I personally love um, the when 
like the nature and the history come together um, and hiking. Uh, so, um, and we work a lot with ODNR. I love Hocking Hills that we have such beauty in mm -hmm. our state. Um, and we have a site called Fort Hill, um, which you may not know, it has a hilltop enclosure, a mound. Um, and so you can hike and you can get the history. So those sorts of, those kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. But then I also want to go to the coffee shop and I want to buy something from the local business. You know, that's like, that's the beauty of, of hitting up these locales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, in Ohio, I, I you know, I, I do have to think about the Ripley, Ohio with the, yeah. the Rankin House. And it's just, you know, you can just visualize. And so in Ohio, that is, that is definitely one of the, uh, my favorites in Ohio. Although I did, you know, like the, the Underground Freedom Center, um, Underground Railroad Freedom Center um, in Cincinnati, because um, it had, you, you learned from slavery to civil rights. Yeah, that's um, so it was the full gamut. Um, but, uh, and you could see across the river. But when you're at the, over there at the, the Rankin House, you were just you're literally looking and where they had to go a few steps all the way up. I mean, so it's just amazing. So I'm going to ask this question. I've already I've already talked to Megan. I think she's probably going to call me a stalker soon. Um, but I want you to talk about being the first female CEO at the History Connection. Thank you. I'm I'm you know really honored, and I think some people are surprised. And I was telling the story at the table, but I'll share. My daughter is six, and she said to me a couple weeks ago. Mommy, are you the first ghoul? She says ghoul instead of girl. Ghoul um, to have your job, and I said yeah. And she said, and was Bert, who's my my predecessor and um, you know former boss, is, was Bert the first boy? And I said, <laughs> no, he was the twelfth boy. <laughs> and she was like, wow, you know. And um, so I'm you know so honored to be kind of carving that path, and hopefully put a hand down to help, you know, bring others along with me. Um, uh, but, you know, I've, I've been interested in women's history and that's one of the ways I got really excited about history too, is looking at the past through the lens of women. So it just, it means a, it means a lot to me. Well, I think we all are pretty excited that <laughs> Megan is there. Thank you, thank you. So Napoleon, what you all don't know is he's been Ask me, what are you going to ask me as if I had a big test book or an AP <laughs> exam or something? Bringing out the test now I'm bringing right out now. the test book. <laughs> Actually, I didn't like history. <laughs> you think you're sweating now. Right. Um, but we are going to open it to your questions because I think that might be even more interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, we have these questions from our live stream and in person uh, audience members. And so uh, there's, a, there's an order here at CMC, so um, you can type your questions into the chat, um, but you can also line up, I think that's mantra, at, yes, mantra's um, th there, and you're gonna be taking the questions. I'll be, I'll be taking online questions. All right, so the first online question that I have is from Nancy Nanny. Does your heritage tourism uh, organization have concerns about the current issue in some states regarding book banning and limiting what is taught about history? Hmm. Well, that's for me. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, no. I, we we don't have a concern with that because you know we are um, you know first we're all within the bus, right? So as we go to different locations, um, we are doing our educational pieces and our conversations on the bus. Um, now, though, it's, it's, it it could spark a good conversation, though, right? Um, to to help understand. You know the book burnings and this, that, and other things that have happened um, in American history. So it's, it's a it's a good topic to be able to address um, as we do others that are topical within the time that we are on the tour because those conversations come up and we help bring understanding to that. So it's not a concern of of kind of what's going on. Um, you know, now if there was some some violence in a way that that of a place court that we're going, we would have to address that and. And, and maybe change direction um, and be flexible there. But other than that, um, we, we consider all of those, all these things that are happening within our country and around the world are great topics to be able to have a conversation on, on the bus. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Julie Moich. I'm a historian and professor at Denison University in Granville. Uh, for the last few years, I've heard social justice advocates and activists talk about how they 
read a lot of history that is written by scholars in order to inform their activism. And so I was wondering if in the heritage tourism scene, if there are gaps in what is available for you that you would like historians to fill. What sort of new research or new questions or new avenues in history do we need to be working on in order to help you achieve your goals? Thank you. I know from our perspective, you know, there's um, a disappearing landscape of um, places related to African American history from the historic preservation perspective as well. You know, how can we be recognizing those spaces and saving them and talking about that history? Um, I think anything that adds more stories to the rich, um, the rich tapestry uh, that that we need to be uncovering more. You, you know, you, you were saying that every every place has its story. So how do we just continue to uncover those? It's hard to give one slice because there's still, um, I think, to recognize there's still so much we don't know. And I think maybe that's the misnomer: is that we have the book, we wrote it, and now we know everything. But we're just we're always continuing to learn. I think uh, I would I would answer that to to I'd almost say like rewrite some of the books, right? Uh, because of the lack of inclusion within those books. And you think about who wrote the books. And so I would say really look at the books and rewrite and or update those books is what's truly needed because when we talk about fully embracing American history, you know, we have the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So rewrite the books. And make, and make them not boring. Because <laughs> it's not boring. Hello, my name is Tina O'Grady, and I recently, this past spring, went on the Heritage Tour down south, the Civil Rights Tour. My question is for you, um, Napoleon, I thought it was exceptional. Um, being at those locations, you can't help but to be immersed in some of those experiences, some of those feelings, and so my, my thoughts are, and I love the idea that you're going to do it maybe short tours right here in Ohio because the same thing happens here and we have a lot of African American history here and civil rights issues here. But I think that the, I, when I was on it, I couldn't help but to think that this is a type of tour. I was somebody who taught cultural competence at state public safety, but this is the kind of a tour that I think um, corporate, government, and community leaders should be on in trying to make any changes or have any serious impact on, on some things. So my question is, is are you going in that direction where you can have corporate America get on these buses? I recently saw that the NCAA took some people down on the same type of tour to have those experiences, their administrators. So I, I would like to see it be in a bigger opportunity and uh, professionalized in a way um, that education for leadership um, in our communities. I, I, I totally agree. Um, and uh, if there's, we we want to be able to focus maybe a, a tour or two tours, and, and, and if, if we have to shorten them up um, to to do that, we would love to be able to have that because you know I'm also a, a director of DEI, DEI, and so to really take the leadership and get them involved and have them have a true understanding is is something that will truly make the difference going. Throughout the, throughout the corporation or whatever it is. So um, so for those who are in here, if you would like to get your corporation together or, or you know, take the leaders of your, of your team, uh, we would really welcome that um, to be able to do something like that. And if it's something specifically for a group that you have, please let us know because it's very important to be able to um, educate those who have such an impact of an overall organization. Okay. This question is from Marla Jones, and her question is, is the panel and audience aware that there are underground railroad signs going up on High Street and State Route 23 towards Lake Erie? Do you think this will, this is going to be marketed to the public? I, I have seen some of those markers. There's, there's a variety of marker programs that exist, um, and I, I think those those kinds of things. We run the Ohio Historical Markers Program, so I'm pro-marker. Um, I don't know if it maybe there is, um, but uh, you know, I think that it is help helpful to talk about when there isn't. You know, sometimes there's not um, the remnant of anything above ground that we can see. A marker can help, um, you know, orient you in space and time. Um, but uh, hopefully, that there's more shared about that. I'm I'm not sure. 
Hi, I'm David Weaver. I'm the director of the Ohio Law Library, one of the partner organizations of Ohio History. And just speaking of which, uh, markers and everything, just a year ago last week, we dedicated, dedicated the Toni Morrison historical marker up in her native Lorraine. And we worked together two years ago to create the Ohio Literary Trail. And I don't think a lot of people know how many literary figures came from Ohio that are also historic figures like Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Harriet Beecher Stowe. And, and so I was just wondering and everything, and now I'm on the uh, Todd Kleisman up there, the America 250 Ohio, uh, one of the committees for that. As we look forward to the 250th anniversary of America's birth, um, do you see that, that cultural, literary, and history tourism will become more important as we lead up to that important anniversary? I certainly hope so. And I think... Um... I just want to shout out the book festival too. And, and um, as far as bragging on Ohioans that um, Ohioana does a great job of that, um, that, uh, you know, it's, it is uh, artists, it's, it's people from all walks of life that are a part of, of history and getting people excited and immersed in the literature, in the music, in the visual arts, in industry, in flight. There's just so many dimensions that it could take. Um, and, and just as you open that up, um, it gets more exciting, I think, and more accessible to more people. I think we have another question. Good afternoon. My name is Wendell Tober. I work for the city. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually a Columbus Police uh, CLO, Community Liaison Officer for Nine Precinct. I've been on the department approximately 25 years now. I had the pleasure of knowing Napoleon most of my life. Kind of grew up together, hung out together, and did some very fun things together. Uh, with that being said, I'm very proud of him and his wife for what they do here at the tours and so forth. But I do, I, I have more of a um, suggestion than a question. Uh, we at Columbus Police, we've done tours uh, of the um, Holocaust Museum in D.C. Uh, we've taken a bus of us, and it's voluntary. And we usually fill up the bus. We've done it for the past pre-pandemic three to four years, very enlightening, very enlightening um, tour. Uh, for the most part, everybody pretty much comes back the changed person from learning from the history. Uh, and also too, we went over to the African Mu American Museum that was incorporated uh, a year or two later. Uh, with that being said, I think your tour uh, would be something beneficial to uh, division and obviously uh, to um, private entities as well. But I think it would definitely enlighten a lot of officers uh, on and off duty as well as, re as well as retirees, too, to what you uh, do and so forth. I'm born and raised here in Ohio, love Ohio, and then what we have to offer. I'm 58 years old. I feel like I got a few years left to learn more about Ohio and anxious to do so. We ride motorcycles, and um, that I think that's a good opportunity, a good way, too, to visit our uh, state and enjoy some of the things that it has to offer. Yeah. Thanks, Wendell. <laughs> um, no, you, you, you make a good point, uh, yeah, because we do ride motorcycles, and we like to, to, to take the riding roads and really to explore um, Ohio. Sometimes we just go, and we don't know where we're going, but we just go. Um, but um, yeah, this, this, is, this is definitely something that um, involving law enforcement um, and some of these tours or some maybe even uh, shorter tours. But uh, again, when you have a, a captive audience and to be able to really just start the conversation because that's what's needed so greatly, especially today, um, especially within, within law enforcement is to be able to start the conversation. And what a conversation uh, starter is to be on a bus and doing, going to these historical uh, locations and learning about history, but also having that conversation about really seeing uh, the, the actuality or trueness of history, um, but to be able to really face that and, and have a conversation on it. All right, this question is for Megan. What is your vision for the Ohio History Connection? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you for that. Um, well, I see that we have this opportunity to be much more visible and vibrant, not just necessarily to, um, for us to grow as, as an organization, but to support Ohio and Ohioans, and that um, our opportunity is really to improve every community that we touch, and that might be a physical place a community or it could be people who are in community together as we are today and um, and I think we can do that by 
bringing people together to be together in conversation. Um, we can we can do that by cultivating pride, you know, pride in place, being excited to be from here and from Ohio, and and also through economic development. And I think that that's where you know I'll be working with our team to continue to push and grow. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tony Bell. I am the proud spouse of Napoleon. Um, <laughs> my question is for both of you, as you know, as I look through this wonderful audience, I see that, you know, we are somewhat seasoned in life, at least out, we're at least 18 years or older here. How would you, how would you encourage one, uh, both organizations working together more deliberately and using that model of young and seasoned alike to make history more exciting and come to life a bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think partnership is a great um, way to do that uh, and creating just intentional opportunities for intergenerational groups to come together. But we also have to tell relevant stories. I think that's part of it as well, is that it's got to be interesting. We need to do a better job of being responsive and connecting to today. And, you know, we um, opened an exhibit, gosh, it's been 10 years ago, about the 1950s. And one of the things we wanted is for people to have conversation across generations um, so that we didn't have a lot of didactic information, but you know, people could talk across groups and across generations. And that takes a lot of work and intentionality, but I think it's a really worthwhile endeavor. Yeah, I think you, you, you bring up a good point because you know, we, we, often, we often say, you know, wow, you know what? We're going through the same thing we went through 50 years ago. You know? And so that's how I think we bring the young people on board is that, to, to your point, is that we show that what's happening now and what you're facing now has happened in the past. And what aren't we doing or what should we do to prevent that from repeating itself again to your kids? And so I think that's, that's where a lot of young people have to understand, well, how does this impact me? Right? If it doesn't, you know, they're kind of out there, this, that, you know, but how does this impact me? And if we can show that, and through partnerships and other partnerships to be able to show that and then bring those conversations together. I think uh, we'll be doing exactly what you said, is to, is to be able to morph the, the young and the seasoned uh, together to learn from each other and uh, um, really, I think, solve some of these problems that we're having. Tony, we appreciate you calling us young and seasoned. <laughs> we're gonna turn things back over to Carrie Schmidt right now for concluding remarks. All right, thank you so much. I hope you found today's forum as interesting and inspiring as I did. And if you're anything like me, your weekend to-do list just got a lot longer. <laughs> so there's much to see. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, thank you for today's partner, WBNS Tien TV. Thank you to our online uh, virtual seat patrons and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. And our special appreciation for today's speakers, Napoleon Bell, Megan Wood, and to Tracy Townsend. Please make plans to join us next Wednesday for Courts Under Attack, the next forum in the Democracy in Crisis series. And thank you all for joining us. We couldn't have conversation without you being here. So thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week.